Scattered throughout most of Eastern and Western Europe are the remains of a once powerful empire. Crumbling and overgrowing, yet hauntingly silent, these monumental structures that were built to last a thousand years have now become the graveyard of a culture and ideology that ended with the death of the Third Reich. The Ruins of the Reich is a four-part series that, that deals with the rise and fall of the Third Reich as told through its architecture, its party rally grounds, its monuments, and of course its massive neoclassic structures. The Nazis loved to overbuild everything. And we begin in part one with the rise to power, which it really deals with the building frenzy of the mid to late 1930s, the Autobahn and Hitler's headquarters in Munich and a lot of other buildings that were constructed by Hitler's favorite architect, Paul Ludwig Troost. And you get inside these buildings, you take a look at them, you see them then and now. In fact, the whole series is a then and now format. So let's go through part one, which deals with the building of the Third Reich, both in its architecture and the party structure and power. The road to Germania began as early as 1933, when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, and an entire nation was set back to work. Groundbreaking ceremonies not only signaled the awakening of Germany's economy, but instilled in its people a new sense of national pride. The new Autobahn roadway system was viewed by the German people as a remarkable example of modern technology, willpower, and achievement in the spirit of National Socialism. In Munich, the architectural revolution included the Leaders' Building, known as the Führerbau. Spanning the entire length of a football field, the Führerbau's enormous size was meant to intimidate and humble foreign heads of state. When we're dealing with the rise of the Third Reich, we, you, no one can escape Hitler's mountaintop retreat at the Oberzaltzberg. We go from the time that Hitler had a little chalet there to the time when he built his massive house called the Berghof. What that area looks like today, the Eagle's Nest, Bormann's house, Spears house, they were all there. We cover every aspect in a then and now format of the Oberzaltzberg in Hitler's private residence. Another 3,000 feet above the village in a scenic little health resort called the Oberzaltzberg, visitors would arrive at an SS gate located just below the Fuhrer's mountaintop chalet. Often described as a clumsy blown up version of an alpine cottage, the Berghof grew from a modest country cabin into an extravagant residence reflecting a world leader. It was here along with his mistress, Eva Brown, that Hitler surrounded himself with his most trusted friends, German pastries, and the sounds of Wagner's heroic operas. The Berkhoff's relaxed and intimate setting also proved ideal for the official receptions of foreign dignitaries. But defying both the elements of man and nature, the ruins of the terrace managed to survive as a haunting witness to one of history's darkest moments. Today, a portion of the exposed driveway is the only evidence that Hitler's Berghof ever existed. In part two, we take a trip to Nuremberg and go through every aspect of the Nazi party rally grounds known as the Reichspartei Gelanda. Now, most of the structures that the Nazis used at that time are still there today some of them not in their original condition, but these structures are massive. Through our then and now format, we take the viewer back to the way these structures looked at the time of Hitler in the Third Reich and as they look today. Designed in the likeness of an ancient Greek altar, the main grandstand called the Hawk Tribuna measured more than 1,100 feet long, 80 feet high, and could seat up to 70,000 people. Today, the massive ruins of the Hop Tribuna, or main grandstand, represents one of the largest surviving relics of the Third Reich, and one of the best examples of the neoclassic style of monumental architecture used by the Nazis throughout Germany. 
Named after Ferdinand von Zeppelin, who landed his great airship here in 1909, this massive field was the site of colorful pageants, elaborate parades, and military exercises, while 250,000 spectators looked on. In addition to connecting both ends of the Reich's party grounds, the huge road, which was constructed out of more than 60,000 slabs of granite, was also intended to serve as a processional avenue for military parades. Today, it's used as a parking lot for the annual fair. We literally take the viewer to Hitler's headquarters, the, what they call the Führerhauptquartier, which was his headquarters located in occupied territories, etc. For example, in France, we go to Wolfschluck II, which Hitler only visited once, but that, that is the only surviving Hitler headquarters that is still completely intact today. From there, we go to Wolfschanze. This is where the attempt was made on Hitler's life in July 20th, 1944. And we go through all the structures, what's left today, and what it looked like at the time Hitler spent so much time at, at the Wolf's Lair. These huge structures, known as Luftschutz, or air raid bunkers, were all dynamited by the German Army Corps of Engineers in January 1945. Directly next door to Goering's bunker was his private living quarters, but it's the decomposing ruins of the Führer bunker that always draws the most attention. From the beginning of its construction in 1940 until it finally came to an end four years later, the Führer bunker gradually reached the enormous size of 120 feet long, 75 feet wide, 30 feet high, and with walls measuring 18 feet thick. Located several miles north of Suisson near the town of Majeville, the vast complex known as Wolfsglen or Wolfschluck II remains the only surviving intact facility used by Hitler as a Führerhauptquartier. Built between 1943 and 1944 as a command center for the impending Allied invasion, the sprawling headquarters consisted primarily of offices, conference rooms, SS barracks, a cinema hall, power station, military and guest quarters, and subterranean concrete flak bunkers. It was in this building called the Führer Bunker on June 17, 1944, that Rommel informed Hitler that the war was lost and nothing could be done to stop the Allies from advancing into Germany. In part four, we're going to go to Berlin, where the war came to an end. We're going to visit uh, the Chancellery, what remains there today, if anything. But the interesting thing is the Hitler Bunker known as the Führer Bunker, was connected to a longer bunker system that ran behind the new chancellery. That part of the bunker system behind the new chancellery still exists, and we were able to succeed in getting in there with our cameras. This is probably the only footage that exists today of the inside of the chancellery bunker because after we came out, it was sealed and has not been opened since. From the emergency exit of the bunker, the KGB chief then made his way past the garden entrance of Hitler's office and toward the ornamental pool where the only intact surviving bunker of the new Reichstransfery lies buried today. Located 50 feet below an island of dirt which was once flanked on both sides by the infamous Berlin Wall, the Chancery bunker was uncovered for the first time in over six decades while workers searched for unexploded landmines in the area formerly known as the Death Strip. At about the same time, workers also discovered a nearby SS bunker that still contained weapons, uniforms, and a colorful display of wall murals. As of today, the city of Berlin has insisted that both bunkers remain sealed and completely inaccessible, using the excuse that they might become neo-Nazi shrines. It was here in the Chancery bunker that Hitler could often be found gazing at an oversized display containing a model of the new city of Linz his hometown in Austria. This amateur video, taken in June 1992 during a series of archaeological measurements, captures what is perhaps the best evidence of how the Führer bunker might have looked since the two were almost exactly the same in design. Several former Nazi government buildings have managed to survive, including Hermann Goering's Air Ministry headquarters, which today houses Germany's finance department. And just a block away, the one-time Nazi propaganda ministry is now the Department of Labor. In Munich, the former Führer building functions as a music school, while the German House of Art continues as a world-class gallery. 
But for the most part, little remains of these colossal structures that once symbolized the power and glory of the Third Reich. As these massive ruins of concrete and rubble fade with time, the legacy of the Nazi regime will forever endure in the pages of history.